um, is it, I'm doing a heavy metal detox. Um, is it okay to add or drink plain celery juice every day during that time? Yeah, it's perfectly fine. Um, unless you're allergic to celery juice, I don't see that that would really be all that big of an issue. Um, what's the best supplement for, for blotting or clotting? Oh, bloating. Okay, so blotting. I, I would, Chantel, I assume you mean bloating and not blotting or clotting because I don't know what blotting is and I, don't, I know what clotting is. But um, anyway, maybe, maybe there's a just a misspell or a typo there. It, but I'm going to assume you mean bloating and I'm going to answer it that way. So best, the best thing to do digestion-wise for bloating is, number one, is to isolate and identify um, what's causing it. And so that could be any number of different types of food. For a lot of people, the bloating comes, if we're keeping to tonight's topic, from a yeast overgrowth. So if you have yeast overgrowth in your GI tract, uh, what will cause excessive bloating typically is, is any type of uh, carbohydrates as a general rule of thumb. That's why the FODMAP diet is popular. FODMAPs are carbohydrates. And, um, and so that oftentimes will be a trigger for individuals bloating is a yeast overgrowth because yeast take any kind of carbohydrates that you eat and they'll ferment them. And a byproduct of that is gas, which is going to cause that intestinal bloating. Now, beyond that, there are other causes. You could be a low stomach acid producer. You could be, uh, you could have low digestive enzyme levels. And so in that regard, taking a digestive enzyme like my Ultra Digest, you might find to be very helpful. Um, if, if you, if you um, again, if you want to take digestive support, another a supplement that we carry is called Ultra Acid, which also might be very helpful if you're a low stomach acid producer to assist you in your digestion. Um, let's see here. Will histocysts stop ringing of the ears? It, 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 you know, I wouldn't say that. That wouldn't be the thing I would say, oh, you have ringing of the ears? Take this. Um, I would first question why you have ringing of the ears, and, and that's, that's probably too deep of a concept or topic to get into tonight because we could talk a few hours about, about different reasons why that can happen. What are the, difference between, what, what are the differences experienced between... Oh, question didn't don't look like they finished asking. Right here. Oh, okay. Oh, being homozygous and heterozygous for HLA-DQ2. Um, okay, good question. So homozygous means same. Heterozygous means different. If you're homozygous for DQ2, so let's, let's pull up my diagram here and we'll get that question answered. How many slides do we got to go back? Let's see. Here we go. I think we're coming to it now. Okay. So as I, as I said earlier, so so this HLA DQ, there's actually two genes. There's an alpha one and a beta one. And so the alpha one has two alleles. So, so one allele from the mom, so it has two alleles. That's an A. Um, one from mom and one from dad. So, so like we say this top one is from dad, and again, this bottom one is from mom. And so if they're both the same, meaning let's say your, your dad had an HLA DQ2 and your mom had a DQ2 and they both gave you a DQ2, then your alpha one gene is homozygous for DQ2. Homo again, meaning the same. If you only inherited one DQ1 from your dad and, and from your mom, maybe you got a DQ1 or something, you know, just, it doesn't matter, something different, then now you are heterozygous for DQ2, meaning you have half uh, of your gene, one of your alleles or half of that gene is a DQ2. So that's basically what that means. Now, is one worse than the other as it relates to reacting to gluten? Um, it, it matters if you're talking about the risk for the, the development of celiac disease, there's a, a, a greater propensity toward the development of celiac disease if you're homozygous for DQ2 than if you're just heterozygous for DQ2. 
But I haven't seen in our research, and we've done thousands and thousands and thousands of these tests on individuals where there's a huge difference whether you're homo or heterozygous as it relates to how severely you're going to react to gluten. We see kind of the same severity of reactions to gluten whether a person's homo or heterozygous. Um, what's the jello-like blob of translucent stuff on the surface of an eye? Uh, it's probably a pterygium. Um, PT starts with a PT, pterygium. The, the P is silent. And that's a, a common growth that can occur on the eye. There are a lot of different reasons why that can happen, but that may be what you're talking about. There are other growths, certainly, that can occur on the eye, but a pterygium's the most common. And generally, they're benign unless they're growing into your field of vision. I uh, can't use coconut except for coconut oil, water, or milk. Can't tolerate the meat. The shreds, unfortunately. So where's the question in that? Don't see a question in that. What's the experience differences between... Okay. I think I answered that one. Do insufficient levels of pancreatic enzymes facilitate the development of celiac disease or does celiac disease cause pancreatic insufficiency? I think that's a great question. And I, in my experience, what we'll, see, what we'll say is that gluten sensitivity causes pancreatic insufficiency and damage. Um, it puts damage, it, it can damage the pancreas. I actually just published a major article on malabsorption. If you go visit Gluten Free Society and look at one of our most recent blog posts, it's a very research-backed piece, you can read more about pancreatic insufficiency associated with gluten exposure um, and not vice versa. Generally, some, the pancreas, pan, remember the pancreas has to have a reason why it's become insufficient, why it's not producing. And so gluten can be one of those reasons for that damage. Certainly there can be other reasons, but um, I would say it, it goes more along the lines of gluten induces the pancreatic problem and not the other way around. Can stress bring in gluten sensitivity and is there a President's Day discount or promo code? There's not a President's um, Day promo code that I, that I think we have, although I think we're right now if you use the promo code OMEGA, and you're looking for high quality omega uh, fatty acid supplementation, there's a sale going on right now for our omega fats. Um, let's see here. Does gluten pass through to breast milk? Ange Angelia wants to know. Yes, it does. There's actually been a few studies that show that in humans that um, gluten can pass through to the breast milk. And so this is where a lot of times if the baby's gluten sensitive and the mom is eating gluten, Breast milk is still a better option than formula milk, but if that baby's gluten sensitive, you could also be passing that gluten down to the baby. So it's important to know if your baby's gluten sensitive, you know, you would want to eat gluten free while you were breastfeeding for sure to prevent that from happening. Um, it hasn't been studied in other animals, to my knowledge. I haven't seen any research that shows that gluten as a protein passes through, for example, cow's milk. Cows are very different, right? They have four. Uh, chambers of their stomach, um, and whereas humans have one, and so so there's there are definitely some differences there. I don't think we could say one with one species it's the same as with another. Not until we can get better confirmation, but that is that is what some some researchers speculate might be the problem with dairy, with many types of dairy, is that there's this there's this possibility unstudied, albeit that 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 could be the case, and that's why so many people go gluten free, also go dairy free before they get to a real resolution of their gastric problems or of their systemic disease. Uh, so again, can stress bring in gluten sensitivity? I think I missed the first half of that question. Stress can absolutely be one of the accelerating triggers. Stress is an accelerating trigger for all disease, not just um, reactivity to gluten, because stress causes disruption of the microbiome. Stress causes micronutrient deficiency. Stress puts your body in a state of hypersympathetic tone, which means that your gut's going to work less effective, you're going to sleep, your sleep is going to suffer. So it, it, it induces a lot of major problems. And, and that's not acute stress so much as it is chronic stress. Um, why do, do we need vitamin K with vitamin D3? I, I read that without K2, it, um, vitamin D can cause calcification of the arteries. Not, not necessarily. That's all kind of conjecture. You're, you'll see a lot of that on the internet. Um, look, I've seen thousands of people that 
I've put on vitamin D that it didn't put them on vitamin K2. And I think if you're guessing, it's not a bad idea to take D with K2. It's not a bad idea. It's just, you know, taking them together ensures that that, that won't be a problem. But, you know, in my clinic, we test people. So there's never a guess. If you're not deficient in vitamin K2, um, but you are deficient in vitamin D, there's no need to give both. We give one or the other. Uh, based on the person's unique outcome or results, as opposed to just saying everybody that takes it should take them both. I don't. I don't think we can make that statement or that claim and be accurate. Okay. A lot of commentary on the antibiotics. So a lot of you were were yeah totally told uh, to take the antibiotic without having the the culture done. Let's see. What do you think, um, let's see, what order do you think cleanses should be in? Kidney, liver, colon, and parasite cleanse. Do you think everyone should do at least one parasite cleanse in life? No. Um, and I don't think there's a, there's a special order. I mean, most will tell you that the cleansing the colon is number one, cleansing out the gut is number one. Um, if you're trying to do it all in a specific order, but here's the reality of cleanses. Your body is a filter. Your liver filters all the time. Your kidneys filter all the time. Your intestines and colon filter all the time. Your lungs filter all the time. Your skin filters all the time. They don't do it in order. They do it in their order. They do it of their own volition based on what they're being exposed to. And I think, I think people rely too heavily on cleanses and not heavily enough on behavior, right? And if you have good behaviors that match who you are biochemically as an individual, if you eat well and you don't subject yourself to poisons and toxins on the regular and lie to yourself that those things that you're subjecting you to aren't poisons, I think you don't need to worry or focus on having to do cleanses all the time. I think cleanses are, for most people, are, are a crutch that they use to say, this is the way I'm going to start and become successful, right, in my health. But where you really have to start to be successful in your health is start by promising not to hurt yourself anymore. And that means through your behaviors. And so once you change your behaviors, your kidneys, your liver, your lungs, your, your organs will love you. And they can repair and they can recover when you no longer feed them poison or expose them to poisons. And that doesn't necessarily require a ton of cleansing. Uh, that's why, I mean, the cleansing market, don't get me wrong, the supplement cleansing market's a billion dollar industry and, and some people will swear by it. But what I see time and time again, it's not to say cleanse can't be helpful, but don't rely on the cleanse if you haven't changed your behavior, because if that's the case, you're just gonna, basically you're using a cleanse the way a doctor uses a drug. You're using the cleanse for symptomatic reduction without ascertaining the origin of why your problem exists. And that's just, just a bad place to be in your health. Let's see, Dennis informed me there's likely an infection in an old crown with a root canal, only one I've had, referring me to endodontist for retreatment. I know these infections can be problematic systemically, but no biological dentist near me. So where's the question in that? My input on that would be, you know, you need to find a biological dentist. I'd say get get you um, get you the right type of X-ray. They do it or, or image it called a cone beam, so that you can ascertain whether or not that thing is infected. Because if it's infected, you know there are a number of different types of treatments that a good environmental dentist or biological dentist can implement. And so I would I'd certainly I would get with one because if you go, it's it's kind of like going to standard medicine. If you're looking for a doctor like me. Um, well, let me reframe that. If you're looking for a doctor like me, but instead you go like a general practitioner, you're not going to be happy if you're looking for a doctor like me and vice versa, right? If you're looking for standard practitioner and you come to a doctor like me, you're not going to be happy. And I think ultimately, if you, if you have a problem in your tooth and you go to an endodontist, you may not be happy with that type of recommendation that you might get coming from that type of dentist or doctor. Um, simply because philosophically it's not a good fit for who you are. It might be worth doing a little bit more research to find an environmental dentist. There's a great website, IAOMT.org, 
And this website um, is a da- has a database of different uh, trained environmental and biological dentists. And so I don't, I don't know if you've looked there, but hopefully you haven't, and that is helpful as a resource for you. Um, let's see, Linda's asking about options to ARBs. There, there are a lot of other options. That, you know, the, at the end of the day, you have to talk to your, to your prescribing doctor. I mean, ARB is one style or one class of blood pressure medicine. There's, there's calcium channel blockers, there's ACE inhibitors, there's diuretics. So there's multiple classes of blood pressure medicines, and so you just have to have that conversation. Uh, protonics, can protonics cause leaky gut? It sure does. It, it, protonics blocks stomach acid production, and that is one of the things that allows for bacteria that don't belong in your intestine to make it into your intestine and create um, barrier breaches that, again, barrier breaches, a.k.a. leaky gut. What damage can years of cow's milk drinking do? Um, depends on the person. Um, but I, I would say no damage done to your body has, to, you don't have to think of any of that damage as a permanent fixture in your life. You, this is where, again, you have to evolve the strength to make the changes today. Your body has a miraculous ability to heal despite the past damage or trauma that you've done to it through eating, etc. And so you've, you've got to make changes today to get to that. Is organic almond and coconut milk okay? Um, no carrageenan gum as a thickener. Yeah, I mean, they're okay. They're okay as a general rule, provided, again, you're not reacting to almonds and not reacting to coconut. But yeah, as far as gluten is concerned, I mean, what you got to be worried about in the other, in the, in the milks, in the, the, the plant milks, if you will, they're not really truly milks, but it's a lot of the fillers. So just read your filler list. And if your filler list are all real foods that you can pronounce and you know what they are and they're all generally good for you, then I don't, I don't think you're, you're falling too astray there. Thoughts on lipomas. Um, so for most people, lipomas are accumulations of fat deposits underneath the skin. They're relatively benign, but really they're, they can be kind of a um, kind of an insight into an, a, a bigger problem. And so, and so there are a few different problems with lipomas. One is if you have lipomas, you shouldn't drink alcohol because alcohol can contribute to lipoma formation. Increases in blood sugar can increase um, lipoma formation because excessive blood sugar converts into fat, and that can end up as fatty deposits on you, in you, under your skin. Liver damage. Also, so I would I would suggest if you've got a lot of lipoma and you don't know why and it's happened rather suddenly, you look at these three areas first and just make sure you're doing things right. Um, what's the best natural remedy for severe osteoporosis? Um, natural, finding out what you're deficient in, Valerie. So if you don't know what you're low in, so your bones require, a lot of people, a lot of doctors are, are super guilty of this because they study, they don't study nutrition. So they say, just take calcium, right? And calcium, although it's important for your bones to be mineralized, it's only one of many minerals. You need magnesium and zinc and selenium and boron and strontium and vanadium. And so if you haven't had those things checked or tested, then, you know, natural remedy wise, you, you want to understand what you're lacking nutritionally that helps your body or assists your body in mineralizing your bone. Protein, too. A lot of people are protein malnourished, but, but one of the big things, too, as well, Valerie, there are two other things I would suggest. One is low exercise or not doing weight resistance activity. Bone grows on, based on pressure, so if you're not applying daily gravitational force against resistance, your bone will slowly demineralize over time. It will become less and less dense as a result of inactivity. And then the next issue or the next thing is, is really is to look at if you're eating gluten because they're, they're, we know that gluten can cause a form of autoimmune bone loss. And so no amount of calcium or mineral supplementation is going to fix that diet that, that change that may need to happen for you. So get tested, make sure you get genetically tested to see whether or not gluten is playing a role in your bone issue. Let's see, I think I answered that one. There was another question about um, tonsil stones. And tonsil stones, in my experience, are one of the most common causes of tonsil stones is food allergy. And I've seen a lot of tonsil stones be caused as a result of gluten exposure. Okay, let's see. 
Can you make sourdough from the warrior bread mix? Kim wants to know. I don't think we've ever tried to make sourdough, be, but I mean, you know, if you want to give it a try, maybe I'll talk to our to our chef and see if they'll give that a whirl. And I just I don't want you to spend the money and do it because we haven't tried it. So I don't want to tell you to try it. Um, and then you end up losing a batch. Uh, question about overcoming almond allergy. Can it happen? Can you overcome an almond allergy? Possibly. Um, a lot of food allergies or food sensitivities are not permanent. They're, they're what are known as transient or acquired allergies. And so it is possible. Now, if you're having acute reactions where your lips swell and your throat constricts and you end up in the hospital, probably not. But if you, if you have what's called a delayed hypersensitivity, then that is very possible, something you may be able to overcome. Hey, if you've got a functional medicine or health question that you'd like me to answer for you, make sure you send me an email, glutenology at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to create a video answer just for you. Have a great day.